are so excited that you're back with us for another episode of Meet My Mississippi Authors and Artists. And I'm telling you, I know the coolest people. And today, <laughs> you are in for a real treat. Okay, you get to see a real interview, a real person who knows how to interview people. And <laughs> you'll see what I don't do right. <laughs> But okay, I never use cards or anything, but today I want to just read this little introduction about this lady that we have with us today because I don't want to miss the important things about her and then we're going to, of course, talk about them like we're just sitting on our front porch or something. Katina Rankin is co-anchor of Local 24 News, yes. is that correct? That's right. And CW30? Well, you, uh, I used to be. Used to be uh -huh. in Memphis. We have to get it all in there. Yes. Katina is a native of McGee, Mississippi. Yes. Okay, with a bachelor's degree in mass communications from Alcorn. Mm -hmm. We want to get all that in there. Alcorn State and a master's degree in journalism from Jackson State. Uh, and Katina has anchored for WLBT in Jackson. Yes. Okay, and WSMV TV in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Okay, and WTVD, is that right? Yes, that's right. Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and WAPT TV in Jackson. Yes. Okay, I just want to get all that in there because I want to get the shout outs to all the people in Jackson and the other areas and say, well, Katina's been with us and you didn't mention this, so y'all cannot talk about me, honey. That I got it right from the and one more and very important thing, Katina Rankin is the founder of Katina's Classroom, a 501c3 designed and designated, dedicated to helping improve students' literacy, or, um, uh, literacy and food insecurity in underserved communities. Yes. Is that see? That's my heart. I love that. So. I know. Now, now it's time for your interview. Tell us a little about yourself. Where did you grow up? You were born in McGee. Yes. You grew up in McGee. Went Absolutely. So I am a proud Mississippian. Okay. And let me say that. Yeah. Everywhere I've gone and people say, where are you from? Mm -hmm. I proudly own the Magnolia State. Absolutely. The Magnolia State shaped me into who I am today. Love that. So I grew up in McGee, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little small town. Absolutely. It's about 40 miles south of Jackson, Mississippi. Yes. McGee Elementary, uh, junior high is what it was called then instead of middle school okay. and high school. Okay. And then as you mentioned, I went from um, McGee High School to Alcorn State University okay. and from Alcorn State University, I went to Jackson State University. Wonderful. So my education is rooted in the Magnolia State. Love it, love mm -hmm. it, love it. Oh my goodness. So then when did you know that you wanted to be in journalism? When did you know that you had this gift of gab and to talk and just the way you talk and the way you present? Did you know from a young age, like Oprah says that her grandmother always knew this girl can talk. Did anyone ever tell you that as you were growing up that you had that kind of gift of talking and the way that you present yourself? Because you do have a very distinct way of presenting. Thank you for that. You know, I didn't, mm -hmm. um, but my mom, we grew up right across the street from a church. Okay. 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 And so um, whether it was Sunday school, mm -hmm. whether it was church service, mm -hmm. any single program, whether it was Easter, whether it was Christmas, right. anything that the church was having, mom would make us go okay. and mom would make us participate. Okay. In my junior year in high school, WSJC Radio, 8, 10 a.m. Okay. in McGee, Mississippi, mm -hmm. the program director was there. Mm -hmm. And after I gave my speech, she came up to me and she said, you have great pipes. See? I had no idea what pipes meant. Yes. And she had to explain voice. Yes, and she said, you thank you. Oh my goodness. So she said, we have this overnight gospel DJ position available. Mm -hmm. And she said, would you be interested? Mm -hmm. So of course I would. I'm in 11th grade okay. in high school. So I had to convince my mother that I could go to school mm -hmm. full time, mm -hmm. that I could work my little part time job at Fred's as a cashier. Mm -hmm. And then after I got off from work there, go straight to the radio station and work from six to 11. OK. And so she let me do it. And so the bug bit me. That is wonderful. And I enjoyed worshiping and giving God praise. Mm -hmm. And so my senior year in high school, I worked in the counselor's office. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know where I wanted to go to school. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to look over on a, a bookshelf mm -hmm. and I grabbed the first catalog that I saw and it happened to be Alcorn State University. Mm -hmm. And I was just flipping through it and I saw mass communications and I thought, oh wow, this seems glamorous, it seems fun. Why not give it a try? Mm -hmm. So I applied to Alcorn State University, got accepted a full scholarship and then my journey began. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. See how God works? You yes. up there, that's where you were supposed to be? And yes. That's it. So tell us about your different anchoring positions 
positions and jobs? Where did you go first and second and third? And Well, to be honest with you, uh, my sophomore year in college, I went to the communications chair and I said, hey, look, I really want an internship at a television station. Okay. And he said, I reserve those positions for juniors and seniors. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a bit stubborn, okay. right? Okay. And, and growing up in McGee, Mississippi, I was always told, well, you have that Southern dialect mm -hmm. and you're too country. You mm -hmm. can't really mm -hmm. be on television. Mm -hmm. But once you tell me I can't do okay. something, there's a motivation within me that says, I'm created in the image of God That's and amazing. I can do what I want to do. Hello. So after I left his office, I called WLBT only because they were the number one station in the market. Okay. And I asked who was over internships and they told me. Okay. I went home that weekend and asked my mom if I could borrow that little blue Dodge coat that she mm -hmm. had, mm -hmm. put on my best Sunday go to meeting clothes, drove an hour to Jackson, walked into the lobby and said, Katina Rankin to see Jackie Gary, please. Okay, determination. Don't tell, let people tell you you can't do it or tell you no. Absolutely. Kick the door in. And Go so in the window. They, they, the receptionist said, do you have an interview, an appointment? And to be honest, I fibbed. All right. So don't do that. Okay. <laughs> but I fibbed and I said, yes. And so she said, one second. And she called upstairs and I sat down and I sat and I waited. Mm -hmm. And I sat. Mm -hmm. And I waited. Mm -hmm. And Patricia, I sat and I waited okay. until about an hour later when Jackie Gary came down those stairs, took me to a conference room, interviewed me, and told me to start the following Monday. And I had an internship at WLBT. After the internship, they hired me. I was behind the scenes, but nonetheless, my foot was in the door. Absolutely. And so after the um, internship, uh, they hired me. I was a weekend assignment editor and then eventually moved on to a weekend associate producer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They did not give me my start on air. Mm -hmm. But what they did is, is when the Byron Della Beckwith trial was going on, they had me as what's called a runner. Mm -hmm. So Ed Bryson was the reporter. And mm -hmm. once you went into the courtroom, you could not leave. Mm -hmm. So he would point when someone would get off the stand for me to go out of the courtroom and interview them. Okay. And during that period, I was also working as the news director at a radio station, mm -hmm. WJMI mm -hmm. in Jackson. Mm -hmm. And so this guy who used to be a television anchor in Atlanta named Ron Saylor mm -hmm. had begun this all news talk radio station. Mm -hmm. And he would call every day for two weeks during that trial. And he would ask me to give an update on the Byron Della Beckwith trial. Oh, wow. And after it was over, he said, look, I have a noon to 1 p.m slot available here in Atlanta, would you be interested? Mm -hmm. Well, even though television was my heart, I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so at that point, I'd had a little uh, pink and green Cavalier. Okay. And I put that Cavalier on the uh, interstate and I hightailed it to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Worked there for almost a year and then the station went belly up for mm -hmm. funding. Mm -hmm. So I happened to call one of my mentors, Judy Also Brooks Meredith, mm -hmm. and I said, Miss A, the station is going belly up. I don't know what to do. Just give me some encouragement because she had been a mentor to me. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, I know the news director over at WAPT. Mm -hmm. She said, send me your stuff from when you were at WLBT. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I'll send it to him. Mm -hmm. Well, he called me, asked me for an interview, and then he hired me as a reporter. Mm -hmm. Six months after reporting, he put me on the weekend anchor desk. Okay. And then eight months after that, I was blessed enough to get the main anchor position at WAPT. Of course. So it was the first time, and I was really excited, that they had had an African-American woman in that position. Wonderful. So again, God opened doors and he blessed. And Absolutely. so that's how that journey began. Oh, my goodness. And you have won, and you have uh, gotten so many awards and accolades from what you do. What are some of the uh, things that you have received from just reporting? And well, I've gotten a lot, but I think the one that I'm really most um, proud of is the story that I did on Emmett Till. Yes. Uh, it was an Emmy-nominated story. Right. And it was when the Interpretive Center opened in Sumner. Mm -hmm. And my news director said, hey, I want you to go down and I want you to cover the story. Mm -hmm. So I traced the actual footsteps mm -hmm. of Emmett's last 24 hours. Wow. Okay, we started out at Moe's Wright's house where he went to stay with mm -hmm. his uncle. Mm -hmm. um, from there, we went to Bryant's grocery store mm -hmm. and what was still left of it. Right. From there, we went to the barn. Mm -hmm where they took him right. and where they allegedly beat him and, you know, gouged out his right yes, eye and true. shot him in the head. Mm -hmm, yeah. And then from there, we drove to what is now uh, an Emmett Till Museum right. and where they went and got that cotton gin. Right. And I walked through that area. Mm -hmm. And then we drove to the Tallahatchie River and stood on the banks to where they pulled Emmett out. Oh, wow. 
And so I'd heard about the story of Emmett Till all my life growing up because my grandmother and my mother would make sure that we knew the yes, story. Absolutely. But it was nothing like walking the those footsteps steps. and going in it. And oh I could not goodness. sleep I for chills. two weeks. Yes. Um, so I, I was like, this is an important part of history mm -hmm. and I have to tell the story right. Okay. So I put a lot of work, a lot of effort and a lot of prayer into that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm really proud of being uh, nominated for an Emmy yes. as it relates to Emmy. Yes, Emmy nominated. Okay, we are going to go backwards with your books. Yes. Because we're talking about Emmy Till. So we're going to go directly to these three books. Now you had a little uh, snippet on there to, to kind of tease us and tell us what was the thing? It was three books in three months. Is yes. Gonna be? Oh my gosh, I can't remember. <laughs> no, yes. remember you, uh, oh, believe you remember I, that. I just kept sharing it and sharing it. I was like, she's going to do what? I I know. It was like a news announcement. She was like, I'm going to do something three books in three months. Where did that come from? Why did you decide to do that? How? Why? You know, it was just a God given idea because I pray about everything that I do. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, God, how do I release these books? Mm -hmm. And he said, three books in three months. Okay. So from covering that Emmett Till story mm -hmm. when it ran mm -hmm. uh, on the air, um, God said, I need you to write a children's book about Emmett Till. Okay. And I said, well, oh, God, how am I going to do that? I said, you know, it was some gruesome details yeah. in there, so how yeah. can I make it kid-friendly? And he said, do that. write the book. Do that. And so that night when I got home, just on my cell phone, I typed in the first sentence, Mommy, what's oh. wrong with his face? Oh, my goodness, looking at the casket. And so for an entire year, I came home, and I looked at that first sentence, and I had writer's block. Oh, my goodness. And I got off work one night, and God said, well, I went to bed. It was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning because, you know, I'm mm -hmm. late out with mm -hmm. the night shift. And he woke me up at 4, mm -hmm. and he said, write. And I said, God, you're going to have to give me the words because I don't know how to go any further. Mm -hmm. And so he gave me the words that night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your biggest critics, critics are your family members. Oh, yeah. So I sent the manuscript to my two older sisters. Mm -hmm. And I said, read this, because they had children mm -hmm. in the uh, right. age group. Mm -hmm. And I said, is this okay? Would you let your child read it? Mm -hmm. And they said, it's very strong, mm -hmm. but it's an important, important part of history. history. Publish it. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, the sister that's two years older than me, she called back and she said, you should write a civil rights series. Okay, and these should be in every Mississippi home and uh, everyone should have these in, in, in Mississippi and all over the United States. Well, My thank goodness. you. And your subtitles, I yes. absolutely love. Now you have Emmett Till, sometimes good can come out of a bad situation. Yes. Then you have Megger Evers, he taught his kids to crawl so we could stand and we'll go into that in a moment. And then the March on Children, the story of James Meredith's March Against Fear. Yes. Love, love, love all of those. Now tell them a little bit about what that means about he taught his kids to crawl because, be, you know, so we so just saying. So I had covered, you know, Byron Della Beck with the man who murdered Medgar Evers. Right. I had covered that trial. Mm -hmm. I told you about that. Right. But I started to do some research. Mm -hmm. And I read about his family. Mm -hmm. And how he taught them. Yes. And so part of the story was is because he had such a target on his back because right. he was fighting for civil rights in right. Mississippi. Right. That whenever um, the kids or Murley would hear something, his wife mm -hmm. in the house, he would tell them to get on the floor and crawl. Right. So that if the bullets came through the windows, they wouldn't get hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he taught his kids to crawl. Oh so we could stand. Absolutely, love that. I mean, they are so powerful, I love that. And the story of James Meredith's March Against Fear, and we're gonna be interviewing him soon. And you were just down in Jackson at the two Mississippi Museums. Yes. To talk to, uh, what is it called? What is that series that they it have It was down Read, there? Engage, and Discover. Exactly. Yes. So then you talked to the kids about all your books, and then he was there. He was surprised he? us. Yes, and he came out for the reading of the book, which Absolutely. that really blessed me. Okay. And so I have, um, in my journalism career, I've interviewed James several times, mm -hmm. but about him integrating Ole Miss. Right. But there are certain stories that people don't know don't. about James. Exactly. 
which is he started in um, Memphis, Tennessee with this march, march against fear. Exactly. And he started at the Peabody Hotel and he came down through Mississippi. You know, he got shot around mm -hmm. the Hernando right. area. Right. And then that's when, and he wanted to be a loner. Mm -hmm. He didn't want any national attention attached to it. Right. But once he got shot, mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it was came down that picture and joined was all it. Over the world. Yes. And then Stokely Carmichael came aboard and got involved with it. But anyway, they continued that march on to the state capitol mm -hmm. there in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. And it was the largest march and rally at that time. Wow. And he said that he was simply doing it as an exercise of faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that story was important because with everything that's going on in our political climate yes. in this day and age, Absolutely. we need to know that if we feel really important about something, mm -hmm that we can make a difference. Absolutely. One person can change the world. Absolutely. And Megra Evers' daughter was there also at the site. Rena came, came too, and that really surprised me. And after I read the book, she got up and she spoke. And when I tell you that blessed me, it blessed me. That is wonderful. Because covering that trial, I'll never forget after the verdict was read and we was waiting for Merle to come out. The one thing that I remember that's etched in my mind is when Merle said, the first thing out of her mouth was, all I want to say, Megger, is yay, Megger. Yay, yay, yay. Isn't that something? And she never gave up. Never gave up. And people were telling her, give up. Yeah, you, you know, your murderer will never, the murderer will never be brought to right. justice. Uh -huh. But she didn't give up. She didn't give up. Oh, my goodness. A force of intestinal fortitude to keep okay. going. And you did those three books in three months, and now we're being blessed by those three books. Now, I went back for, backwards with her writing career here. We're going to start where you started. Yes. With the baby. Mm, with my now little baby. tell us about your first book, Up North, Down South. So, when I worked at WTVD in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, my sister and her two kids came to stay with me. Okay. And McKinley, the main character in the book, yes. uh, is actually my nephew. Yes. And the other character in the book is Mc, uh, Kendall, his sister. Yes. And so from the time I think McKinley could talk, I don't think his first words were mama or dada. Mm -hmm. I think it was read. Okay. And I was getting ready to go to work one day and he, he came up to me and he said, read, T.T. T. Reed, and he had a book in his hand. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I got looked at the watch. I was like, I got a few minutes before I go to work. So mm -hmm. I sat him on my lap and I started reading the book. And he was so engaged with the words and looking at the pictures that on the way to work, I asked myself one simple question. And that question was, and I asked it out loud, just driving. I said, oh God, I wonder if I could write a children's book. Okay. And I let it go. And then the newscasts were 11 o'clock there. Mm -hmm. So when I got home about midnight, I had this big dinosaur, this Dell computer. Okay. And when I got up to my room, I just sat on the bed and I sat the computer on my lap. And I just wrote the manuscript. And I was like a kid in a candy store. I knew that at 5.30 in the morning, like clockwork, that my sister, their mother, would get up and fry bacon. <laughs> So when I heard the bacon, I ran downstairs and then I heard the pitter patter of the little mm -hmm. feet coming downstairs. Mm -hmm. And so I said, TT wrote something for you guys. And so I read the manuscript to them and they liked it. But to be honest with you, Patricia, I think that they just liked it because they heard their names okay. inside the book. And that is so wonderful. But oh because I am asked to go out and speak at a lot of schools and read to, at schools, I just printed the manuscript and I just, you know, um, would read the, read the manuscript to the kids. Mm -hmm. And when I thought, well, maybe I have something here, is when the kids started drawing pictures because it wasn't yeah. illustrated and, could you and read sending the me pictures. Of your book? Uh, well, yeah, about oh, yeah, this one was from Marcus L. Thompson, the Chief Administrative Officer at the Mississippi Institution mm -hmm. of Higher Learning. Mm -hmm. And he said, many children anticipate and even long for a summer vacation to an exciting destination that they have never visited. This book takes children on a journey across Mississippi while addressing still two common misconceptions about the state in an age-appropriate manner. This book entertains the reader while showing that Mississippi is a wonderful state with wonderful people. I believe this book will instill pride in Mississippi's children as well as help the children outside of our state gain an appreciation for Mississippi. And it does in such a simple way. Now tell us, um, how did you 
oh my goodness, just how did you come up with the concept of what you wanted to do with it about the traveling up north, down south to explain to them? Well, you know, you know, I grew up, grew up in McGee, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so right. we had first cousins who mm -hmm. lived in New York right. and who lived in California. Right. And we would take turns. One summer we would spend it in New York. The next summer we would spend it in California. And then they would come down mm -hmm. to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that the first cousins from New York, when they would come down, they would say, oh, you guys are so country. Mm -hmm. You say y'all and you wave at everybody that you see on the street and even though they were just te teasing as children that sort of stuck with me a little mm -hmm. bit and then when my niece and nephew were born and their first cousins who would come down from New York were telling them the same thing mm -hmm. I thought okay let me take this to show that even though we live in different geographical areas mm -hmm. even though we may dress differently even though we may have a different dialect mm -hmm. that at our core we are more alike than we are different. Absolutely. So I really wrote it for kids in the South, Mississippi, Louisiana, mm -hmm. Alabama, Arkansas, um, Louisiana, to know that it doesn't matter where we are. Absolutely. That we are just as important as anyone else. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you use the book for all kinds of things like geography, little lessons. Yes. What, what other things do they learn just out of this little book? You did a lot of little clips and things about Reading tips. Reading you did your just, research. Yes, I be, honey, I follow you faithfully. Do everything <laughs> you do. And I love the little clips to give the teachers and the, the mothers and parents to, to know the teaching points that are in this book. There are so many. Well, first we learn about the geographical areas. Mm -hmm. Like we learn why Mississippi is considered a rural state. Right. And they say we're country. Right. So right. we learned about the country folks. But right. we pinpointed out on the map right. to show it's southern uh, and then New York up top we learned that it's a more northern uh -huh. state right and so we also learn about the Statue of Liberty and why it's called the Big Apple uh -huh. and so there are you know teachable moments inside the book so many and then when they make it down south we learn about farming because they are passing uh -huh. uh, the pastures and they see the cows uh -huh. and you know they even see a mule and so right. they learn about how those animals are used okay. in farming and how we actually eat Love and that. we learn that they go to the supermarket and that those uh, fields that they see or that those gardens that they see when they're coming from driving from Jackson Mississippi down to McGee Mississippi that this food ends up in supermarkets that your parents go and buy those things uh -huh. So, and yeah. kids, some kids these days don't know. That is a big teachable moment. People are my age, they don't know that some kids, younger kids, don't know how they get the food. That They just think it comes from the grocery store. Yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. And it's our history that we don't want to let go of, that we don't want them to forget, even though uh, with all the modern technology, things are changing a bit. Yeah. But I think that they need to know how it all began. Yeah, they think that canned green beans come just at Kroger. <laughs> they don't come out of a field. <laughs> Tuesday in Kroger where somebody picks them and the whole thing. Yeah. That is so wonderful. And then you have a coloring book and activity. Um, so I'll tell you how that happened. Okay. So when I was going and reading the book to different schools, mm -hmm. some of the teachers would say, oh, it would be wonderful if you had some type of activity book mm -hmm. to further the teachable moments mm -hmm. from inside the book. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the coloring and activity book was birthed. Look at that, y'all. And they, and they do all kinds of little things in there. Mazes, um, dot to dots, everything. word searches, all of it. And kids have done like book stories, or, you know, the little Tripod book thing. I just like, oh my goodness. Oh, that blessed me so much. At the book fair. Yes. And they have so much to use for the story and they can relate to these to, you know, McKinley and was it McKinley? Let it, me get McKinley, yep, McKinley okay. and Kendall. Okay. Yes. And okay, now this one this one floored me now. Come on now. What in the world? Kendall's Kitchen, healthy and hearty recipes for kids. How did you come up with that, Katina? Well, you know, it's, it begins with prayer. So I said, okay, I need to write a sequel to Up North Down South. Mm -hmm. And so in Up North Down South, it's like McKinley and his two first cousins right. in Mississippi. And they played this trick on Kendall, mm -hmm. you know, about what it's like growing up in the South. Mm -hmm. And so she thinks, okay, I'm going to get them back. Mm -hmm. And so my little niece, she loved to cook. Mm -hmm. And she stayed in the kitchen at a very young, young age. While kids were watching the Cartoon Network, she was watching the Food Network. Okay. And I said, okay, so we'll get the boys back in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so then God said, well, why don't you make it a three-in-one, something that most people don't have. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, A, tell a story, write the book. B, give the coloring and activity pages for the teachable moments. And then why don't you get some um, recipes from local art about chefs and artists 
to actually teach kids how to cook healthy meals and hearty meals with their parents or grandparents in the kitchen. Wow. And so I used a local chef there in Jackson, uh, Nick Wallace, and he provided some of the healthy recipes in the book, mm -hmm. as well as I used um, Alcenia mm -hmm. uh, out of Memphis, Tennessee. And then another cook that I used was, uh, and his last name is Cook, is oh Chef Cook goodness. out of Memphis, Tennessee. Go so they presided there. They have done some little segments of them cooking and making recipes from this. And this, this is absolutely amazing. It was really fun. So they're still in Mississippi when they write Kendall's Kitchen. So okay. another book will come out to where they go to New York. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Love, love, love it. Now tell us where, how you got your books published? Never, I, I wanted my niece and nephew to see themselves on the cover of a book. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, growing up there's not a lot of diversity and mm -hmm. so kids don't actually, kids of color don't actually see mm -hmm. themselves on a book. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well okay, I'll just publish it just so they can have it in mm -hmm. their library and they can see themselves, mm -hmm. you know, reflected on a book. And so I started with the traditional um, publishing houses, mm -hmm. children publishing houses. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe I sent out four or five and I only heard w back from one, mm -hmm. which was a rejection letter. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, God, maybe it's not meant for me to publish mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. okay? And so, cause I think that book was written like in 09. Okay. And so then when I got to Memphis, Tennessee, I realized that I wasn't going there for an anchor position, that it was about much more. Okay. Because mom was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Okay. And so I would get off on a Thursday night and I would drive down to McGee, which mm -hmm. was four hours, okay. um, get a quick nap and then wake up the next morning, drive her to Jackson for her chemo appointments. Mm -hmm. And then we would drive back to McGee and I would get her set up for you know the week ahead and mm -hmm. buy the things at the grocery store that she needed, get her medicine and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, she wasn't feeling well one of the times after chemo and so I was back in the room because she kept my bedroom exactly how it was when okay. I was growing up. And I had left some stuff in there from Raleigh Durham and I was flipping through it and I found the manuscript. So I grabbed the manuscript and I went and I crawled in the bed with her and I read her the story. And she looked over at me and she said, publish it. Okay. So when I drove back to Memphis and went back to work that um, following week, I was on my break and one of the ladies who, who's actually from Mississippi, who works at the station, I said, hey, do you know anybody who draws or illustrates books? Mm -hmm. And she says, well, I draw, but I've never illustrated a book. I said, well, confidentially, because I'm private. Mm -hmm. I said, confidentially, I'm gonna send you a manuscript and I want you to read it and I want you to tell me if you think that you can illustrate it, draw mm -hmm. some pictures. So a couple of days later, she came back and she said, Katina, I prayed about it. And she was like, I know you're very meticulous with your work. And mm -hmm. she was like, I'm afraid to do it. I said, do you think you can do it? And she said, yes. And I said, so begin. Oh my goodness, so perfect. And so, that's, and so that's how it was birthed. And after she did it, I said, you know, I'm not pitching to any more. I'm sorry, I take that book around to read. But so that's, it's a little warrant. Um, and so I said, okay, I'm just gonna self-publish. And so I reached out to a couple of the journalist friends who had self-published, asked them who they went through. And that's how that journey began. That is so wonderful. Now get us up to date on Katina's classroom. Oh my goodness! And you go, you adopting these? Where I can't even remember what. Tell okay. Us all about. So it. there's a story behind Katina's classroom. With every single book that I sign of up north, down south, city folk, me country folk, inside it I put with books you can go places. Yes. Hashtag read. Yeah. Well, you know, death and life is in the power of the tongue, uh -huh. and also in the written word. And I had no idea that from writing that book that it would land me in Africa. Uh -huh. um, so the book sort of took off in um, North Mississippi and in Memphis. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And what I noticed is, is that when I went to underserved areas, schools that were performing badly yeah. with C and D reading scores, uh -huh. um, that there was a need there. Because you know, if the kids don't get reading down packed by third grade, it's hard for them to matriculate okay. throughout the rest of their right. time in school. And so I said, okay, God, what can I do? And he said, well, start a nonprofit that deals with literacy. So when I started looking at literacy, I found in these same communities that the kids were going home with brown paper bags that the principals were sending with them because they would not eat mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if they, they did not send food home. with them. Yeah. And if they come to school hungry, then they can't learn at the same level as other kids who are getting healthy and nutritious meals. Mm -hmm. So we began that journey, and then I'll never forget it, January 1st, mm -hmm. I had to work. And I had gotten home and I was in the middle of my bed and I always turn on national news mm -hmm. when I get home while I'm trying to decompress from the local news. Mm -hmm. And I heard God say, 
go to Africa. And I said, well, okay, God, we're in Africa. Africa's huge. And he got quiet. And he didn't say anything else the rest of the night. So the next day when I went back to work, I had to go out for a franchise that I cover, which is called Local Good News. And I was with the chief photographer. And I said, you know, God told me the darndest thing last night. He told me to go to Africa. And he said, really? He was like, my wife is from Ghana. And I was like, oh. And we left it alone. We did our story. I went back to the uh, shop, read over my scripts for the five and six o'clock show, and it was done. I got home that night and God said again, go to Africa. I said, well, God, do I go to Ghana? I said, you still hadn't told me where to go. So when I was in Raleigh, Durham, I had this intern, Adore Adjure. And um, Adore was from Nigeria. So I just called her, taking a chance that she would be up. And I said, hey, Adore, I said, you know, God has me working with literacy, but he told me to go to Africa. And I said, um, do you know of any schools in Nigeria that needs help with books or anything like that? And she said, I don't, but let me call the television station where I used to work there and the PR firm that I used to work with and I'll get back with you. I said, okay. So when I hung up with her, I had my cell phone in my hand and I just logged on to Facebook and I was scrolling through and there was this lady who popped up on my timeline and she was asking for rice to feed children. And she was like, it's the one meal a day that they get, the only meal that they get. And when I clicked on her link, I saw that she was located in Ghana. And the name of the school at the time was Noya. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, okay, is this it? Silence again. And you know what it's like to get silence from God. <laughs> and so then the next morning I was awakened by a telephone call and it was a jury. And she said, hey, Katina, I checked with my folks and they don't know of a school in Nigeria. She was like, but there's this little school called Noya okay. in Jamestown, Ghana. I said, you don't have to tell me anything else. Yes, I get it. So I rallied family and friends because, you know, I make a decent living, but I don't make a lot okay. to just up on a whim, hop up and fly to Africa. Y'all got to go to Katina's classroom <laughs> page and see all these amazing pictures. You went over there, you've gone over there, you did what? So when I got over there, um, I wasn't prepared for what I saw. I had researched enough to know that the kids were orphaned and abandoned. So what I did was, is I made it on a Friday did a little sightseeing that Saturday. They're six hours ahead of us, so my body was still trying to adjust. And that Sunday when I got up, I said, you know, I need to go to church. So I found a church to go to, and then I took a, just, a, just a crew of three on this mission trip. Mm -hmm. And I told the photographer that I took and the associate producer that I took, um, I said, let's go to church. So we got up and we went to church. And afterwards, I had this brilliant idea. I was like, okay, let's go by to school. We're not supposed to be there until Monday, but let's just go so we'll be acclimated, so we'll see what's happening. And they were located on the landing beach. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was the Atlantic Ocean right mm -hmm. there, and then it was the beach, and it was right. a ton of fishing boats. And they make these fishing boats by hand. They cut down trees, and they make them out of it, and they put those boats in the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Okay, they use buckets to dip the water out. Mm -hmm. Imagine a boat that, like, we put on a lake without a motor that they're putting in the Atlantic Ocean to go fishing. Okay. So it was the first thing I saw. But when we drove to that landing beach, you know what it's like, the smell of a fish market, mm -hmm. a fresh fish market when you walk in it. You know what that smells yeah. like. Now, add into that the smell of feces and the smell of urine. Mm -hmm. Because on that landing beach, kids were sleeping in the fishing boats mm -hmm. and they were sleeping in wooden boxes that may be the size of both of our chairs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that just had a sheet on the floor mm -hmm. of the box. So I immediately just began to weep. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh God, what is this? Mm -mm. And in the middle of that God village was the school. Mm -hmm. Because a lady who was there visiting from the States went down to take pictures mm -hmm. on the landing mm -hmm. beach. And Africans don't like you to take pictures of them because they feel like you're taking a part of their soul. Mm -hmm. Right. So she asked if she could take some photos and one of the gentlemen there said, if I allow you to take this photograph of me, what will you give back to us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she looked over and she saw a little makeshift school, which was Noya. And so we sort of partnered from there. Who supports this school? Because they, they're all in these uniforms and clean and looking good and they're smiling. We all raise the money. Time. Well, we purposely did that because 
um, we didn't want to embarrass the children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we raised money to buy the uniforms. That's beautiful. Um, and the teachers who are there who just work for 65 US dollars a month, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? they wash the children's clothes okay 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 um and 65 us dollars a month you may think oh well it's a third world country and so that's probably a lot of money mm -hmm. well you know the journalist in me say well let me check and see how much a one right. bedroom apartment cost over right. here and they were 900 dollars mm -hmm. so if you're a teacher making 65 us dollars a year then you're truly doing it for the love mm -hmm. of the kids mm -hmm. and the love of the profession mm -hmm. so what we did was is we um took enough money over to buy year uh, rice for a year okay. to pay the teacher salaries for a year oh, wonderful. and we created their first library because in their little makeshift yes, school they didn't yes, have a library okay. we're going to show y'all all these pictures <laughs> they are amazing so we did that and um i felt really good and i was like okay god i'm going to continue to help the children i noticed that um after their one meal a day, you know the little chairs that you can get from like the dollar tree uh -huh. that sit on the floor that's about this high right. there was a little orange barrel mm -hmm that sat there and they had poured um, bottled water in it and after their rice it was a little green cup and so the kids would go and dip their hands into the little water bucket mm -hmm. and they would get one sip of water and they would put it back and the next child would come and they would only get one sip of water mm -hmm. so when I got back I said okay God what can I do to help these kids get their own bottle of water mm -hmm. just one bottle a, bottle a day and I said give me a fresh idea and I was sitting in front of my computer when I was praying. And after I finished that prayer, I heard ding, you know, like when you get an email. And I looked, I was like, oh, this is spam mail. <laughs> and so when I clicked on it, it was wristbands. Okay, yes. And God said, wristbands for water. Start a campaign uh -huh. to where you buy these wristbands and you partner with schools, you partner with churches, and you sell these wristbands to raise money for those kids to get water. And that has gone so well. Everybody has on those wristbands. And that. Now tell people just anywhere out there how they can help with Katina's classroom and help with the school in Noya. How can they? Okay, so I have to tell you the next part of the story because yes. after I got okay. in the water, I thought I was done. Okay, right. Okay. Tony, I thought you were done at the beginning. Okay. I was like, she just keeps on going and going. So about three months after that, I was in bed and I was I was knocked out mm -hmm. and God woke me up and he said call Rahel who was the headmistress of the school like a principal mm -hmm. and he said ask her what's going on with the school mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I called and I said hey Rahel God woke me up I said what's going on with the school and she said oh auntie she said because an enduring term for right. a woman over there is auntie right. she said oh auntie God must truly be with you she was like the government just stopped by and said that they are selling the landing beach including the school to the Chinese for a $60 million grant to put a fishing harbor there. I said, well, did they provide a new place where they're going to put the school? And she said, I don't know. She said, I am um, going to the governmental meeting that they're having tonight. And um, I said, okay. I said, but this is strong in my spirit. I said, you need to go and find another plot of land for a school. And she was like, auntie, they've been talking about doing this since 1965. Nothing is going to happen. I said, Rahel, if I trust nothing else, I trust my spirit and I said my spirit got me over there and I said and my spirit is telling you to go look for another plot of land she said okay auntie I will do it she said I will leave school now and I will do it so she emailed me back later and she told me that she had talked to this chief and that you know he said that you know they could build a school there if something happened well I went about my day as usual and then the next morning I woke up to video from her with them bulldozing the school down mm -hmm. with some of the kids inside. What? Mm-hmm. And so um, I was sick, I went to work, I had to come home because I adopted all 130 of those orphan and abandoned kids and committed to feeding them for a year and to getting them water for a year. And I was sick and I didn't know what to do and God said, get to work. And he said, raise some money to build them a school. So I partnered with two other women, one woman that was in New York and another woman that was in Colorado and that we had never met. But we had both been drawn to that little school that sat on that landing beach in Jamestown, Accra. Mm -hmm. Jamestown, Ghana, near Accra. And so it, we, we built the school. And it's nothing fancy, but it's better than what they were in on the right. landing beach. Right. And so now that the school is up and going, we, they still have the same needs because they're orphaned and abandoned. So they need the operating costs, mm -hmm. the cost to pay the teachers, the right. cost for the food mm -hmm. um, and everything like that. And so that drive continues. 
And so um, Katina's Classroom, starting that nonprofit, which has only been open for about a year, has right. been a blessing because people wouldn't even do ten, donate 10 or $15 right. unless they knew that they could get some type of write-off with the right. EIN. Right. And so I've been able to do that. But you know, um, it's hard to get people to donate, period. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay? Trust me, I know. And then especially <laughs> if you're going to another country mm -hmm. when there's also a need here in the United mm -hmm. States. Right. But what I tell people is, is that poverty here is real. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it firsthand. Yes. But it's nothing like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we take so much for granted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's where God led me to help. And so that's where I'm helping. That is so wonderful. And you still go to underserved all throughout yes. uh, our communities here in Mississippi, yes. Tennessee. And Arkansas. Yes. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. We love that. Now tell us. How they, can they donate to Katina's Classroom? Do they go to the website, go to the... Yes, what? they can go to katinasclassroom.com okay. and then there is a donate button there that will take them to PayPal. Okay. Um, there's also a cash app that is strictly Katina's Classroom mm -hmm. and they can donate there. Okay. And again, tax deductible because it is an official 501c3. And if you want to know what she's doing, honey, there are hundreds and hundreds of pictures. <laughs> I'm telling you, you would not believe. I'm like, what? How do you have the energy and the money and the whatever to do? It's amazing what you're it's doing. It's God, and I'm it stepping out on amazing. faith. And we just, about two weeks ago, we went to Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, Palenque is where the first uh, freed slaves in the Americas mm -hmm. uh -huh, were. And so they have actually kept that area. Mm -hmm exactly how it was and they still speak the Palenque language right. which is Spanish which is weaved into some African about how you know mm -hmm. the two together right. and so they could communicate with each other and so we went there and then we adopted uh, some students at the Alex Roker Center and um, they needed a library so we set up a library there gave away books mm -hmm. and then the children there also needed clothes so mm -hmm. we went a tad out bit a tad, tad outside of our scope because usually it's just books and mm -hmm. it's just food right. but those kids needed clothes and so we did that because they have a level one to level six mm -hmm. um, economy so level one is the poorest level six is you know uh, expensive mm -hmm. rich right. and so these kids were in a level two mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so we adopted the kids there Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, we could talk all night about the things that you have going on. Thank you so much for coming to be. Thank with me you. Today. You have oh. blessed me just hearing your story and other people of how you don't take no for an answer. I don't. When you have something going on and you're passionate about something, go with it, go through it. And can I tell your people this? So, all the books are available on Amazon.com, okay, right? Yes. But here's the key okay. 100% from the proceeds go into the nonprofit. Okay. <laughs> so, I don't keep a dime okay. from any of my book sales. They go straight into the nonprofit and wow. then we put it back into the community investing in kids. How do you do it? Oh my goodness. It, when I tell you that God is keeping me, He is keeping me because okay. I'm exhausted. Cause so, I, I'm at work from 2 until about 1035, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time I make it home, it's about 1115, and I immediately start working on the nonprofit. I'm checking in with the schools that I've adopted. Okay, send in emails. What do you need? The school year's about to start, okay? If we're in the middle of the school year, where, where are you? And um, the people who have mostly been donating have just been very close friends mm -hmm. and family. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, okay, God, take this and multiply it. Mm -hmm. If you could do it with the fish and the five loaves, okay. then you can do it for me too. Okay. And so a lot of it has been personally funded. Mm -hmm. Every extra penny I get oh goes directly goodness. into the nonprofit. Oh my um, but it's where God has me right now. That is amazing. Because you know? I, mean, I get tired watching that Katina's classroom <laughs> pictures. I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> How in the world do you do all of this stuff? It has yeah. to be so rewarding. When I saw the kids singing to you oh my God. and all that, and it's just like, When oh. I tell you that melted my heart, I had no idea that they were going to do that. And then the little bookshelf with your books up there and the other books that were donated for reading and... I mean, it's just, if, if you go on that site and your heart isn't moved, there's something wrong with you. Well, you know, it's funny because my pastor said, because uh, every day, you know, he calls to check on me every uh -huh, day, uh -huh. say a prayer over me. And so every day I'm talking about the schools. And he was like, if those kids, then win your heart. 
He was like, because all you do is talk yeah, about those no, kids. You, it just comes through on Facebook. When you oh. look at your posts and things like that, it's all about Katina's classroom. But and you know what? Kids. People can be cruel. They I can't can. tell you how many oh, inboxes I've gotten oh. where people are saying, I'm sick of hearing about those oh, kids no, at yeah. Africa. Exactly. Same thing with me and me by Mississippi. They don't want to hear. I don't I care don't. about what you don't want to hear. And I don't care either. I don't care what you don't Until hear. God tells me to stop, I'm what? not stopping. And look, I make mistakes every day. Yes. Okay? every single day and I'm nowhere near perfect yes. okay yes. and I'm real blunt and I'm real yes. crash and a lot of people can't take that because right. I give them straight right. truth Absolutely. but until God tells me to stop with this project I'm not stopping and when you're passionate about something and when you have your mindset on something you need to go through it if it's a good thing yes. to do that yes. and I actually produced a documentary a 30 minute documentary mm -hmm. on the school yes. in Africa and so I'm praying about God when do I release it and who okay. do I release it to okay. it's going to come a place where it's going to fit in and it's yes, going to work out. Yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness. See, didn't I tell y'all we have the most amazing people. You wouldn't have known anything about all. You would have thought she was just a pretty face. Oh my sitting goodness. Sitting up there on TV every day. Mm -hmm. But honey, no. This, she has something going on. Now you need to go to Katina's classroom. See all those wonderful pictures, those beautiful faces. Get these books up north, down south. Kendall's Kitchen. We have a coloring book and activity book. She's blessing us to, you know, to help her, her be a blessing. Emmett Till, Medgar Evers, March on Children. Okay. And can and I do a tease and just do it yes, for your show? Yes, please. Okay. So then you all need to stay tuned because, of course, there's a children's book coming out about Africa and it's called A Kofi Tale based on Kofi Annan. Okay. You heard it here. Okay. We got an exclusive. <laughs> right. I haven't announced that yet. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, so it's coming it out before the end of the year. Oh, my goodness. Meet my Mississippi authors and artists. If you miss an episode, honey, you're going to miss something. You better not miss <laughs> not one episode on the Hill Country Network. Stay tuned. It's inside me, girl, it's in the air. It's who I Before I do my last part. Oh. But yeah, it comes through. It's, so oh it's a goodness. it's a labor of love. How do you I'm tired. I'm tired right now. I'm I'm exhausted. Because when I start, start seeing you going over there and doing all that, did you take some pictures while we talk to a few more while this is what I eat?